talk about um, a bit about what high performance computing is and sort of how I got into this as a job through a, a somewhat strange route, as actually many people who work in this field do. Um, and then a bit about how this seems to be on the verge of a very big change and a, a whole load of technologies are sort of combining together to really quite radically change what has actually been a fairly stable field for the, probably the last 10 or 15 years. So firstly, sort of how I got to this position. Um, I started off doing an undergraduate degree in Aberystwyth University or University of Wales Aberystwyth as it then was um, with um, software engineering in the Department of Computer Science. And as part of that degree, as I'm sure many of the students who are here tonight are familiar, you have to do an industrial placement. And I went and worked at Hewlett Packard, which had just been um, merged from Compaq um, in Galway in Ireland. And actually they had very recently, I think four or five years earlier, bought another company called um, DEC or Digital Equipment Corporation, who for many years had made fairly large mainframe computers and had started branching out into high performance computing systems. And I worked in a, a fairly small group doing high performance computing systems. And we had then what was the third most powerful computer in the world, which is the, the picture in the middle there, um, a system called ASCII-Q based in um, Pittsburgh in the US. And we also had quite a few other systems that were nearly as large um, dotted around the world. Um, I then came back to Aberystwyth and did two more years of study and sort of branched off into robotics. And my final year project as an MEng student was working on a sailing robot. And I then went and did this for several years as a PhD and built lots of robots that sailed out in the sea, which didn't seem to have much to do with high performance computing, although I did do a bit of um, simulation work for those that ended up running on a, a very small high performance computing system that we had in ABBA at the time. And then I continued that work for several years as a, a postdoctoral researcher again with a bit more um, simulation going on, um, you know, largish desktop computers, but nothing too big. And then the funding kind of ran out for that. And like many people in um, research, I had to then find another job and I ended up working on a project called Software Alliance Wales, where we were training up people from industry with various computing skills. I then went and worked in IBAS, the biology department um, for the National Plant Phenomics Centre. So they have this giant imaging system that runs around these plants in this automated greenhouse and will then do image analysis on them. There's various imaging modalities, so there's infrared modalities. Um, the pictures that you're seeing in black and white at the top um, right corner of the screen are actually done with a CT scanner, trying to see inside the plant grains as they're growing um, without having to destroy the plant. And backing all that up is quite a large amount of computation and especially a very large amount of storage. The picture on the left is the storage array, actually as it stands more or less now, um, was a bit smaller a few years ago, but that's now over a petabyte of storage. And when I initially started that job, I wasn't too responsible for the actual underlying infrastructure. I made use of it um, from what other people in IBIS were providing. But then some of those people left and I was the most knowledgeable person about this stuff around. So I kind of ended up taking it over because there was no one else to, and my job relied on this stuff working. Um, while I was in that job, I remember going to a conference all about um, managing data for large plant experiments. And one of the people there did a talk about the need for people who had a, both a software engineering skills and um, research skills, often people with PhDs, but also with some kind of software engineering background. Well, that's exactly what I did. And I thought, this is great. Someone's describing the job that I'm doing here for certain and kind of the previous few jobs I did. And they're putting a proper title to it, which was research software engineer, which is now my job title. And up until then, I'd had a wide mixture of job titles that really all came down to, yes, writing academic software and maintaining it and also maintaining the infrastructure that made it run. And it did feel like this maybe wasn't the best career move because the people who seemed to get promoted were the people who wrote lots of academic papers, not the people who wrote software or maintained computer systems. Um, but then I saw this job advert for the Supercomputing Wales project and they were advertising for research software engineers. And I thought, well, that sounds quite interesting. I'll go and apply for that. And I then, after several months wait, actually thinking I hadn't got the job, realized that I had got it and started with that in 2017. So just to sort of clarify, I'm guessing many of you here aren't familiar with um, high performance computing, but what exactly is it? It's effectively having very big computers. In the 1990s, um, 
there were sort of two strands to this. A lot of people had traditional mainframe systems or very specially built um, systems with totally different architectures, totally different processes to what you would find in your ordinary desktop computer or even your low end servers. And there was this term that came out in the 1990s called Beowulf clusters, which meant taking commodity parts like ordinary PCs and maybe tens of hundreds, even up to thousands of them, and joining them together to build these relatively low cost supercomputers. And the picture on the right here is actually one we built in ABBA. This was taken around about 2005 um, and actually worked as a part time job while I was doing my PhD, maintaining this system and a bunch of others like it um, for the computational biology group. The sort of more grown up versions of these use proper server hardware, um, a bit more like what I showed in the previous image. And the key thing that sets them apart from just having a bunch of computers in a room is that they're normally linked with very, very high speed interconnects or networks, which range these days anything from 50 to 1200 gigabits per second in speed, which is kind of starting to approach the speed of local RAM, although the latency between them is much, much higher, um, orders of magnitude higher. Typically attached to these as well, there will be some kind of very large amount of storage. We don't usually put storage in each of the, the computers, we call them nodes. Um, instead, there'll be a few dedicated storage servers with um, many, many hard disks in them. And to improve the access speeds, normally you'll spread your reads and your writes across several of those disks at once. So instead of all of your data being on one disk, it's maybe spread across 10 or even 100 disks. So you can simultaneously read or write to all 10 or all 100 disks um, to get faster access speeds. There is a list that's compiled known as the top 500, listing the top 500 publicly known, at least, computers in the world. Um, you do actually have to submit your system, so some people still don't bother to submit to this, um, but usually the top few want to um, show off how good their system is, and they will measure the performance with a benchmark that's called LINPAC. And this tries to approximate how many floating point operations you could do per second. So these are you know, basic addition, multiplication, subtraction type operations, and they will be floating point numbers. So this doesn't necessarily um, always show the true performance if you're wanting to do a workflow that needs integer operations, floating point operations may have a very different speed. And the top computer in the world right now is actually in Japan, um, a system known as Fugaku, built by Fujitsu. And that's got a speed of 442 teraflops per second. And actually it will peak at 537, but can't sustain that. The next best in the US, um, a system known as Summit with 148 um, teraflops per second, 148,000, sorry. And there are many others. The US tends to dominate this list, although China has been making headway in it in recent years. The UK normally has a few entries, as do a few other um, European countries. And I think the UK's Met Office is probably the biggest one that's in that list. Um, and I've got a feeling they're around about number 10, but I'm not certain I've only got down to number seven on there. Um, just for comparison, a top of the range Intel i9 processor has 18 processor cores. So effectively, it's like having 18 processors in one unit. And that will get about 1.3 teraflops. Um, if you go a bit smaller, a Raspberry Pi 4, the latest and best Raspberry Pi you can get, has 13.5 gigaflops. And if you really want to compare, an Arduino has 92 kiloflops. That maybe is a little bit unfair on the Arduino because the Arduino doesn't have proper floating point support. So any floating point support has to be emulated in hardware. Um, and as I said, this is a floating point benchmark, not an integer based benchmark, but it's still going to be in the kiloflop range, I suspect, if you did do integer operations. It would be kiloflop, it'd be killer ilops or killer lops. So around the UK, we have quite a few large HPC centers that have all been funded by UK Research and Innovation, who are the main funders of research done in this country. Um, they fund the, the research councils who then in turn fund some of these systems. We have one really big system in Edinburgh known as Archer 2 that recently replaced Archer 1. And this is for engineering and physical sciences users and natural environment people, so people doing things like climate modelling. Um, others can use it if they pay, but it's free for researchers in those domains. And that's got 784,544 processing cores. So when you think your typical desktop computer has maybe four or eight, that's quite a lot faster than that. Um, 
But then there's many, many smaller systems. This is actually very hard to write software that can use 700,000 cores at once. And before they let you on there, they actually want you to prove that your code can scale up to anything near that. So you have to go and use one of the smaller systems first to prove that your code is reasonably scalable. And there's a whole bunch of these dotted around the country. So there's actually another one in Edinburgh that's around 10,000 cores. There's one in Bristol, several actually in Cambridge, one in Birmingham, a couple in Oxford, one at UCL, one in Leicester, one in Belfast, and another one in Durham. And these are actually open to anybody. They're not just restricted to those universities. Those universities run them, but they're not by any means exclusive to them. In fact, they won't give you money to build one of these unless you open it up to other people. Um, and each of those has its own kind of speciality. So some of them are intended for particular domains, like some are for medicine, some are for engineering, some are for life sciences, um, and some have quite specialist hardware. So there's some with um, ARM processors, most are Intel or AMD x86. There are a couple that have GPUs for doing machine learning workloads. And then a bunch of them are relatively normal computers. And across Europe, a lot of systems like these are joined together into what is called Euro HPC, which is this European wide sort of federated access scheme, whereby if you're a member, you can get access to any of these systems across Europe um, and sort of find the system that's most appropriate for you. And there's a whole list on Euro HPC's website of what people can get access to. So the people who've used these HPC systems sort of break down into two broad categories. And traditionally, there's been a big emphasis on people doing engineering and particle physics and chemistry um, simulation type work. And in tasks like this, you tend to have processes running on many, many different computers and on every core on them, running some kind of simulation. Each simulation is responsible for a different physical part of it. So let's say we're simulating a, a car moving each processor would be simulating a different area of the car and working out maybe how airflow is moving over that part of the car. Um, and then they're coordinating with each other um, over the network um, to share the information that has to go between them. Because obviously the airflow that's coming out of the front of the car information, the front of the car sort of affects that airflow that then has to be passed to the next bit of the, the computation, which is the, you know, the next bit up the bonnet, and then the bit that's calculating the windscreen, and then the bit that's calculating over the roof and so on. Um, Typically, these sort of workloads have been coded in Fortran because Fortran is a very good language for sort of converting pure mathematical formulas into code without too much of a transition, um, or C. So these are both um, compiled languages. And historically, these kind of workloads have really, really dominated HPC usage. On Supercomputing Wales, we've done some work for the Bloodhound supersonic car, which was you know, simulating airflow over a car, as I was just saying. There's been work on wind turbines and tidal turbine designs. Um, there is a very big international project called LIGO looking for the um, proof of gravitational waves and Cardiff University is involved very heavily with that um, through supercomputing Wales. There have been people trying to simulate you know, how the Big Bang worked, people simulating maybe how robots move around environments, um, people designing catalysts for biofuels and chemistry departments. Um, of course, more recently, people doing things like modeling the infections of COVID-19 and how it can spread around a population. The other and maybe a bit newer sort of use case for HPC is the more the, what we call the big data type applications. So these tend to have very, very large data sets that they need to process in some way. So we see a lot of this coming from um, the genomics people who want to maybe try and see if they've got a gene sequence, where else they see similar sequences and try and work out where um, you know, a particular thing might have come from. I think Nick, who's here today, did some work on trying to find out how related COVID-19 was to um, bats. In the geography department here, a lot of people do remote sensing um, work and look at satellite images or drone images and look for things like changes in land use or how you know, floods have affected an area and want to analyze the, the changes between thousands of these images across you know, sometimes the whole globe or a, a large geographical area. So that requires vast amounts of data. There's one group I'm working with in geography who are just analyzing data for whales, and they've got, I think, 100 terabytes of data just for satellite pictures of whales going back historically. We see a lot of people in machine learning areas where they want to train up machine learning algorithms to recognize certain patterns, often things in images. Um, a lot of work in Abra is done in medical imaging um, within the computer science department, actually. 
So they're um, looking for um, cancers in medical images like X-ray images or CT scans. And also things like text processing, where you're maybe looking for certain trends in text over time, looking for, I don't know, emotions out of Twitter posts. And all of these kind of lumped together is what we call embarrassingly parallel applications that the, the processing can often be independent or semi-independent, but you've got to repeat it a lot for many, many data items. If I want to do the same analysis for a million images, my processing of each image doesn't normally depend on the processing of other images. So there's minimal amounts of communication um, needed between those processes. And a lot of these workloads are more likely to be coded in interpreted languages like Python, R or Perl. And they sort of represent this, this newer generation of HPC users. So there's a lot of challenges in developing software to run on these kind of systems. Um, there's always this question of how you squeeze the most performance out of the, your hardware. Um, I always kind of like this as an alternative to a lot of what the computer industry seems to do, which is kind of almost consider computing power infinite and to just throw away vast amounts of it doing fairly trivial things because it's easy to do that way. And I always kind of hated that idea of, oh, we'll just write this really inefficient library, but it's easy for people to use, and especially seeing that in web programming. HPC always feels like the opposite of that, where every core cycle, every byte of RAM counts for something. But to get your tasks on there, they've got to be able to run in parallel, which most software can't do inherently. So you've got to think about splitting up your processing into some kind of subunits and how you send that data to them and how you get that data back um, is always a really big challenge. And then if you've got to store data, you've got to think about, well, what do you actually need to store? Where is it going to store it? And you get bottlenecks everywhere. So if you're trying to process something and you manage to make the processor work faster, but then it turns out your memory becomes a bottleneck because your memory only has a certain speed limit, or you've got to save it to disk and your disk is much slower than your computing. So the disk slows you down, or you've got to write it over a network and the network slows you down. And as soon as you solve one of these by getting a faster computer, then a bottleneck will always appear somewhere else which is always trying to impact your ability to scale tasks. And there's a, maybe a commonly held belief that if you add more cores, things just go faster. And unfortunately, it's not that easy. And this was actually formulated by a guy back in the 1960s called Gene Amdahl, who worked out the theoretical performance boost from parallelizing code. And what he came up with was that you would have many code a parallel portion, which we can parallelize and run multiple times, but there will always be a serial section that's something that doesn't parallelize. And often, if you've got to split data up to send it to multiple computers, do some processing and then bring it back, it's that splitting and gathering process that has to be serial. And here's an example of Amdahl's law in action where um, we can parallelize 80% of the code, which is pretty good. And we throw more and more processing cores at it, and we see diminishing returns for each call we do because the serial part starts to dominate more and more. And the best we're getting to is about 4.5 times improvement. Despite having thrown of course, 32 cores at the problem, if I threw 320 cores at the problem, it wouldn't go any faster. In fact, it probably goes slower at that point because I'm going to spend more time sending the data out to them and bringing the data back than I do um, actually computing it. So there's all kinds of tools that do help for this. Um, we use a lot of batch processing ideas in supercomputing where we will write a job that runs through a very large set of data and goes off and runs for days at a time quite often. It can really help when we have libraries that have been optimized. A lot of people put a lot of effort into optimizing really good libraries for computation. There's a group, I think they're based out of Oxford, but I'm not certain, called NAG, the National, National Algorithms Group, who spend huge amounts of time optimizing really common algorithms for things such as um, Fourier transform libraries. They even write their own compilers. When it comes to parallelizing things, the technique that probably most people are familiar with is multi-threading. And that works across one single um, physical CPU where you've got multiple cores um, and lets you share stuff out. But as soon as you get to having multiple CPU and multiple computers involved, then you've got to pass the data over the network somehow. And for that, there's two really popular libraries. One is um, called MPI, the Message Passing Interface. And the other is remote DMA. So with remote DMA, you can actually configure um, it as if 
remote memory was local. And when you access that bit of memory, it actually triggers a request to the remote system and brings the data across. So it appears completely seamless. Whereas MPI, you actually have to make an explicit call to an API and ask for data to be sent across. And also recently, a lot of languages have started implementing things that are sort of parallelization light almost with things like parallel for loops. So if you want to loop through a, a list of data and process it as simultaneously as your computer can, you can write a parallel for loop that will do that. And that's appearing in many languages these days. So these big HPC systems are expensive. They usually cost millions of pounds and users have to share them, which means that they can't just log onto them and run whatever they want. They have to actually submit their jobs to a queue. They will be run when the resources that they need are available and then the results are returned back to the user afterwards. And I always kind of liken this to the old days of computing where people had to write out their programs on punch cards. They handed their punch cards to an operator the operator would presumably wait until the computer was free, feed them into the computer, and then print out the result and hand them back the result. And it does still feel a lot like that, which takes a bit of getting used to when you've come from a desktop computer where you can point and click and run things or type in commands, press enter, and they run immediately. Um, and that always causes a bit of problem with especially new HPC users. So using these HPCs does tend to require a lot of specialist knowledge and they're generally Linux systems. Um, I think pretty much all the top 500 these days runs Linux. I don't think there's anything in Windows, maybe one or two at most. Um, and people who haven't come from the Unix world, often one of the first questions they said is, well, how can I get a graphical desktop to run things? Another is not appreciating that these are shared systems. So they say, oh, I need to install the software and it tells me to run sudo install.sh, which is going to go and ask for super user admin privileges. And I'm getting a permission denied error. Well, yes, because we're not going to give you super user access on a shared computer. And then once they do get it running, it's not running as fast as they hope. So they add more cores and it doesn't run any faster. And actually one of the things we do on Supercomputing Wales is we actively monitor the job efficiency, which is the amount of time that a job uses this processor versus the amount of time it's running for. So if someone allocates, say, 100 hours of CPU time and uses one, then they get an efficiency rating of 1%. And then we go and shout to them normally and ask them why their code is running inefficiently and take a look at it and try and optimize it. And the other big problem that causes me no end of headaches is getting software dependencies out there Modern software seems to be increasingly pulling together hundreds of libraries and trying to get that working is always a pain and something that trips up many users, both new and um, old users alike. And the other problem is that most people using HPCs are not HPC specialists. They're not people normally with computer science degrees. And often, even when they are people with computer science degrees, they tend to be at the more theoretical end of computer science and maybe aren't so good at the, the practical side of things. And the reason they're using HPC is because that's the only way to get the answers that they need. And all of their competitors are doing it as well. So the only way to advance in a lot of fields now is to go and use you know, very large high performance computers. And in many ways, we've done all the research that could be done on an easy desktop. And we're now having to push it into bigger and bigger computation because that's where you know, the boundaries of knowledge lie because we don't have the ability to do that until now. And now for the first time we can go and make those kind of computations and get those answers. And because of this, a lot of my time actually goes on training new people. And I'll talk a bit more about that um, later on. So I mentioned earlier that my job title is uh, research software engineer. And we've had this long standing problem in academia where a lot of researchers write software, but the, the whole way academia is set up is that the rewards that advance people in careers are for getting research results and writing papers and you know, making breakthroughs. And those are the people who tend to get promoted and that's what the whole career structure was set up for. And um, people who just write software maybe don't have such great career prospects. But at the same time, more and more research is rely relying on software to make it work properly. And to get those answers to those you know, fundamental questions that we couldn't answer until now because we didn't have big enough computers. Um, the result often is though that researchers write software that's just about good enough to get their paper 
and don't really care about making the software maintainable, making it reproducible so someone else could reproduce their result, making it so someone else could use their software to do possibly something slightly different or even just the same thing with different data sets. And this term has come up in the last 10 years or so of having research software engineers who are people often with a PhD, but also with some software engineering skills who kind of bridge this gap and sit somewhere in the middle between a pure software engineer and a pure researcher to help improve the quality of research software, to optimize it, to take better advance of a better advantage of high performance computing. And to just try and make it, you know, engineered like proper, you know, efficient, well-written software should be. And we've got this growing movement in the UK now of research software engineers, and we've actually got a society of research software engineering sort of set up to get all the research software engineers together and talking about these issues and arguing for um, better careers and better resourcing and showing that software is now important to research. I don't know how many people here are researchers, but if you are and you find you're spending a lot of your time developing software and you're perhaps a postdoctoral researcher who's working predominantly on software development, you're the person in your research group who does computers, you're sometimes not named on research papers despite playing a fundamental part developing the software that created them, and you find that the metrics for career progression don't reflect that, then you might be a research software engineer, even if it's not your official job title. And as far as I know, I'm actually the only person with this job title in Aberystwyth University. I am definitely not the only person who does these sort of things that I can name at least, I think, 10, 15 people who fall into this category. Um, I'm sure there's many more. So I mentioned earlier that we have this Supercomputing Wales project, which is what employs me. And we are a joint project with Aberystwyth, Bangor, Cardiff and Swansea universities. We've been going since 2015 officially. And we were given 16 million pounds in funding from the universities and the European Regional Development Fund. That will be coming to an end at the end of this year. And now we've got to figure out something else for the future. But for now, we've used that to buy two fairly large supercomputers. One is sat in Swansea with about 5,000 processor cores, and another one in Cardiff with about 8,000, plus a whole load of extra bits that have been added onto that since that individual research projects have bought. Um, there's a few smaller bits that have been added to the Swansea one. And recently, the Swansea one also had a very large GPU system put in for machine learning applications, which is open to all of the partner universities, including Ava. And this project is actually the second of these projects. The first one was called HPC Wales that some of the um, more experienced people here may remember. It ran from 2010 to 2015. And I actually tried to target industry and was looking for industrial applications of HPC. And at the time, there maybe weren't too many of them, but the Turned out there was a lot more interest from academia. So with supercomputing wells, they kind of flipped it around and made it more academic focused. Um, but we do allow industrial users to come on if they're collaborating with a university, but we don't allow pure commercial use. So I also mentioned before about this need to constantly upskill um, researchers in using HPC and all the other comput computational skills that go with it. And since 2017, I've been a member of something called the Carpentries, who try and teach sort of foundational coding and data science skills to researchers. So this is things like using the basic Unix shell, how to copy files about, how to use SCP or SFTP if you're doing file transfers to remote systems, how to code in languages like Python and R for data processing, using HPC systems, using version control for your software, um, maybe using a bit of SQL databases, how to also publish data and code as research outputs. And this organization has this open source curriculum for teaching all of these things that's being used around the world. Um, because it's open source, everyone who works on it tends to contribute back to it. And we kind of all share these learning resources that have worked out, I think, really well. And obviously, we can't teach someone in a few days how to become a complete computer scientist when they're maybe a biologist or a geographer. But what we can try and do is focus on things that are easy to learn and things that are really useful. So our Unix you know, course, for instance, will run for half a day and teaches them a handful of maybe, I think, five, 10 really common Unix commands and enough to do some basic data processing. And many of the people behind this are actually research software engineers themselves who are also spending their time not just improving the quality of software, but improving the quality of these training materials. 
So that's kind of setting the scene of how the world currently is for HPC. But now I think everything is starting to change a bit. And there's a whole bunch of things that are converging together that are causing that change. And one of them, and perhaps maybe the biggest driver of all these, is that more and more disciplines are starting to use HPC. It's not just dominated by people doing physics simulations anymore. It's not just people who've written code in C and Fortran and uses MPI. Um, by far the biggest thing that we're seeing coming in the last few years is machine learning applications and deep learning in particular is being applied to just about everything, even traditional simulations. And effectively deep learning is building a really, really vast statistical model of anything you want, which means you can do it on somewhat incomplete data and start to build models that maybe are useful for predicting things in systems where you don't fully understand how the underlying system works. And that can be applied to pretty much any research area. But it is vastly computationally expensive um, and takes a huge amount of processing power, especially for the, the training phase where you're showing it examples of data and trying to train up these neural networks to learn these patterns, basically. Um, Often though these sort of big data tasks don't need the highly coupled parallelism that we've seen in the past. They're not so dependent on those big interconnects that things can be split out in such a way that you know, you're not transferring terabits of data around a network in order to make these um, things viable. Kind of related to that one, we're seeing a lot of new software coming in and a lot more interactive software. And a really popular tool in the last few years has been something called Jupyter Notebooks which is where you write a mixture of code and text into an interactive notebook. And you can kind of see in real time the output of your code. People often use it for um, teaching and you can have things that maybe produce graphs or have little sliders that interact as you work through the notebook. This doesn't play nicely though with the traditional HPC view of you build up a workload, you submit it, it runs maybe hours, even days after you submit it, and then comes back to you with some results when it's finished. And by its very nature, it doesn't tend to keep CPUs that busy. So we're now having to find ways of getting people to share between these interactive workloads that aren't very good at keeping computers busy and traditional batch workloads that run full tilt for as long as they can um, and do as much computation as they can while they're running. The software libraries are starting to change that kind of the, um, the sort of the web and a lot of cloud areas are built up at libraries like Apache Spark and Hadoop, which are quite often used for big data processing outside of HPC systems. And they've almost invented this parallel world to the traditional MPI and remote DMA systems that does things that don't look too dissimilar, but in a very, very radically different way. And trying to marry those two up as being quite an interesting task. Because software is getting so complicated with um, vast numbers of dependencies, a lot of people now put their software into containers and then they can run their software in a container anywhere they like. Um, running containers on HPC has multiple problems. One, that if you want to run something like Docker, traditionally that's needed administrator access and is seen if it's a bit of a security nightmare. So various people have tried to come up with compromises to allow some containerized things to run where they don't need too much security. And containers also by the very nature are built to be portable and to run on sort of lowest common denominator hardware. So if I build a container for my computer, I would expect it to run anything else with at least a similar processor architecture. But that doesn't allow us to take advantage of the very best optimizations that are available that are quite CPU specific. Whereas if I recompile my software, I can recompile it targeting the exact model of CPU that I've got and make the very best and use of that CPU. So it's a bit of a trade-off between portability and optimization. And containerized workloads are often run sort of outside of HPC centers on a system called Kubernetes that can spin up containers, um, run them for a while and then shut them down again. It's often used for sort of scalable web services where you want to suddenly scale up the number of um, web servers you're running to handle increased traffic and then scale them back down when you've got less traffic. But that's becoming an increasingly popular way of also running sort of scientific and research workloads. But that works very differently to our traditional batch processes. Um, it doesn't tend to declare what its resource needs are. It just says, give me a processor and let me run something. And generally the resource needs are not enough that 
you run into resource limitations. With batch processing, you tend to be very specific and say, I need four processing cores, add three gigabytes of memory, and I'm going to run this for 15 minutes. And again, trying to get those two ways of thinking to work together is challenging. And then finally, we're seeing different languages appearing. Um, instead of software being written in traditional compiled languages like Fortran and C, a lot of it is coming out in interpreted languages like Python and R. Interpreted languages, by their very nature, are nowhere near as efficient as compiled languages. The gap on that is closing, and there's a lot of work that goes into optimizing these things and also having a lot of it in underlying libraries that are written in Fortran or C, where the, the sort of the heavy lifting is done, um, or bringing parallelization into those languages as well. Coming with new software and new workloads, of course, is new users. And one area we're really seeing starting to develop is people from the humanities starting to use HPC. Traditionally, this has been very much dominated by the sciences and especially physical sciences. These are often people without any software development or Unix skills, and they will expect a computer to behave much more like their desktop. Also couple of this, we're seeing a greater diversity of users. Traditionally, HPC has been really, really male dominated. And I also find it quite strange that sort of moving you know, slightly different circles around sort of research computing as a whole. And in HPC circles, it will be 80, 90% male. But you change ever so slightly to something that's slightly broader where maybe you're talking a little bit more about things like data reuse and software sustainability and improving the quality of research and suddenly it's more like 50 50. and i think that's going to start to permeate over into the, the hpc area shortly and of course always driving the um the progress of any computation is improved hardware but really for the last 15 maybe a few more years it's been faster and faster x86 processors from intel and amd um, the big change that's happening now is that we're seeing gpus especially from nvidia which are great for machine learning because they're they're massively parallel you can have tens of thousands of cores on one single chip each of those cores is very simple and can't do a lot but for things like machine learning that actually works great um, some GPU-like features are starting to appear in regular CPUs as well, so that the line between the CPU and GPU is getting blurrier. And also other companies are starting to make dedicated machine learning chips that aren't quite as general purpose as the GPU and weren't originally built for doing graphics. Um, one example is Google, who now have their TPU, the Tensor Processing Unit. Um, and I've seen recently they're now advertising that that is in their phones for doing AI removal of background objects on the phone. Um, but they're also being used for doing machine learning research. The downside of these is they tend to be really, really um, focused on certain ways of computing things. And as soon as you don't do it exactly their way, then the performance falls off. Um, I guess also coupled with that, and I didn't put it on the slide, is FPGAs, field gate programmable arrays, where you have a chip that you can essentially program in the hardware to do whatever you like. And so people have been trying to program those up for machine learning tasks. Um, and that, that works quite well if you can get your head around um, programming FPGAs, which is not a, an easy task by any means. But we're certainly starting to see the big vendors offering FPGAs alongside traditional CPUs and GPUs. Um, so for many years, Intel and AMD have dominated the, the processor market, um, both sharing the same architecture, effectively the x86 architecture. And that is starting to change where we're seeing companies like ARM starting to break through into HPC. Traditionally, ARM have always dominated you know, small things like phones and embedded systems. Um, the system that was actually built as a tier two center in Bristol, the, the Isambard system is all based on ARM processes as a kind of proof of concept to show that ARM is now viable for HPC. And there are quite a few other process initiatives going on. I know the European Union are trying to um, ensure that more processes are both developed in the European Union and built there. And they've got initiatives to design their own CPU, so they're not reliant on American technology, especially um, for doing that. There is the RISC-V open source processor design that at the moment is really focused on the low end of the market like ARM used to be. But I can see that moving up in the coming years and starting to be a player um, in the HPC space as well. And we're seeing changes to storage as well. Intel have promised for many years, and it's now finally happening, um, something they're calling Optane, 
which is kind of halfway between a disk and RAM. It has the speed of RAM, but hopefully one day, it's still not quite there, the capacity of a disk, and it's non-volatile, so you remove the power and it doesn't lose its contents. And that sort of shifts the whole computation paradigm when that happens. Um, right now, a lot of workloads don't entirely fit in RAM, and we're finding we have to swap them in and out of disk, and that's hugely inefficient to do that. Or we're having to buy machines with vast amounts of RAM to do it. Um, we have a couple of nodes on a cluster in ABBA with a terabyte of RAM. Um, on supercomputing Wales, most of them only have 384 gigabytes. And there were a few people who complained that 384 gigabytes wasn't enough for them because they needed to load half gigabyte, a half terabyte to terabyte data sets into memory. With something like this, that becomes a lot easier because effectively your disk is your memory. And of course, the big elephant in the room really is the cloud. For the last 10-ish years, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have dominated being able to sell you computing on demand in their cloud systems for not too unreasonable rates. But when you want to buy 10,000 cores, that starts to add up quite fast. And doing the maths on that, it is still nowhere near cost um, e equivalent to go and buy a supercomputer from one of the big cloud providers and rent it continuously. Where it does make more sense, though, is if you want a little bit of, or even a larger bit, of extra capacity for a relatively short amount of time. And for those researchers who say, this system's too busy, I've got to run my workload now by tomorrow, I need 10,000 cores. Well, we can't just go out and buy another supercomputer with 10,000 more cores by tomorrow. We wouldn't even get that in six months or probably even a year but you can go and rent them from one of the cloud providers and have that immediately. And so there's been this attempt to make um, systems that merge both the cloud and traditional sort of on-premises HPC together, where you can have an extra queue perhaps that you can submit jobs to that goes out and spins up instances in the cloud um, as and when required. One of the big limitations of this still is billing, that trying to get researchers to be responsible for billing um, things that could cost tens of thousands of pounds at the press of a button is kind of difficult and doesn't fit well with the university financing models yet. Whereas what we tend to do with HPC is either we give them free access having funded it up front, or we actually ask them in advance to kind of calculate how much they need and they get so many sort of computational units and they, they buy those. And I suppose that could work that way with cloud, but that still doesn't quite join up with how some of the cloud billing works at the moment. And like everything else, these systems are on the internet and they're a great target for hackers because they're big Linux systems running, you know, fairly standard operating systems, often Red Hat or Ubuntu or OpenSUSE. And they have all the same vulnerabilities that all the other computers running those operating systems have. And something that hackers love to do today is hack into systems and run Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency miners because you can make money by breaking into someone else's computer and stealing their cycles. And what better computer to break into than one with hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of processing cores. And back in mid-2020, this happened to several big HPC systems. One of them, the Archer system in Edinburgh was compromised amongst this. And what is thought to have happened is that there was a user who had accounts on several big HPC systems. They had SSH keys set up, so they didn't need a password to log in between one system and another. That often is used to ease data transfers between things. And once someone broke into one of their accounts, they'd broken into all of them and had access to a number of big European supercomputers that way. Keeping these systems up to date with security patches is always a challenge as well, because um, these are running 24 seven and changes to the software can alter people's results. You know, if you go and change a library that's new in someone's calculation, even between them running two runs of it, you could actually alter the result that they get even unwittingly that you know, even the, the author of the library may not have intended to cause that, but that has been known to happen. Um, and even it happens intentionally. I've seen examples where, for instance, the color of a graph changed between two versions of a graphing library, the, the default colors in it. Um, an even bigger one, if you go between Python 2 and Python 3, the way that integer division happens changes. So you get totally different numerical results if you do an integer division in Python 2 and Python 3. Um, and hopefully a security patch doesn't make a change that big. But it's still a problem when people are very much attached to running the same software, and you, of course, want them to run the latest secure software to prevent a hacker getting into the system. 
So I hope that's got you thinking a bit about this. Um, if any of you are researchers at the university and need to use a high performance computing system, then please get in contact with me. Industrial collaborations are possible, but pure commercial use isn't. You need to have some kind of research angle for it. We've made some really big investments recently in GPU systems for machine learning. We have the new NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Um, these are probably six or seven times faster than the previous generation. And both on supercomputing Wales, we have those, and the computer science department here in ABBA has just bought a new machine with them. And actually, I'm in the process of just buying one of these for IBAs as well, because a lot of um, genetic software is now started to use GPUs. So if you are anybody who falls into those categories and wants to get in contact and run stuff, then please email me on cos at abba.ac.uk. There's also the supercomputing.wales website with a bit more information about some of the things that Supercomputing Wales does and some of the sort of workloads that we run. Thank you very much, Colin. That was uh, very interesting. So if there are any questions, you can put them into the chat or um, raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask the question that way. Uh, any questions for Colin? So I see a raised hand already from Leica. Uh, yes, hello. Um, on one of your early slides, you mentioned that languages, um, interpreted languages like Python tend to be used for big data. Is there any particular reason why interpret, interpreted languages are better for this data set? Um, I think they, they tend to, it's more that the, the generation of language than something fundamental about them being interpreted. But it's just that they, you know, the sort of features we see in Python in particular and R are very good at working with um, those kind of data sets, like being able to split out subsets of a data set really easily. You know, in Python, you can use the slicing operator and do that very simply. Um, R has got this inherent data frames idea that makes, you know, loading data from like a CSV file very simple to do. Trying to do that in a lower level language like C is just a lot more work. Um, I'm not saying there couldn't be libraries like that in C, but there don't seem to be at the moment. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, a question in the chat. Is it possible to run applications run on HPC on quantum computing? Is there any research being done in this area? Yes, actually, I should have mentioned quantum computing in the, the hardware changes as well. But um, that's another big change that's likely to be on the horizon is people are going to start using quantum computers, probably in conjunction with traditional computers. Um, because there are you know, classes of problems that work very well on quantum computers that don't work on traditional ones and vice versa still. Um, there's also, there was a whole lot of research done here a few years ago um, on quantum computing, where they were actually simulating quantum computers on traditional computers. Um, but we don't currently have access to a real hardware quantum computer as supercomputing Wales. But I think some of our vendors are getting close to trying to sell us one. Um, hi, Colin. S sometimes um, in my work, uh, there's a fine line between writing a piece of software, which it might take a day or two to run on a laptop or a desktop computer, for example, um, or it could take a week or two. And obviously, if it takes a week or two, you would you would do what you've been discussing for a talk and, and, and turn it into something which is multiple threads, multi-threading or parallelization. However, in my field, as like sort of you know, genomics, bioinformatics, are, are most of the users of the software I write are actually biologists. So if I can write something that they can then just run on a laptop, and it might take a day or two, or even a week, they might prefer that than having to learn all of the complexities of a HPC, even if it means they can run it in a day or an hour. Or in, yeah. You know. So for me, I've still been very reluctant to write software for HPCs because of the end user still isn't there yet, if, if you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think those sort of 
the interface between the two is getting a bit blurrier. So things like Jupyter Notebooks, you can now have backend things that go and submit the task to an HPC. And obviously that does need a bit of configuration, but it's a nice, easy way you can present a nice interface to a user. And maybe we could start running things on web interfaces instead of SSHing to a command line. So a user goes to a web interface, they don't really understand what the infrastructure behind that is. They, they click upload their data set, they choose what processing they want, they click go and the results come back to them. But but again, it does require in the in the in the world of VPNs and uh, making sure you're you're secure and connected. That does require you being connected to a university. So just for example, my my account has just been locked today, and I don't know why. And I'm not able to reactivate it. So of course, th things like that, any kind of access to a system, yeah. not able when you're working from home more. Um, I don't know. I just think that we we we're still not. Sometimes it is best not to write something for HPC, but also um, you, it, it. But but knowing where that line is, and sometimes knowing where your application is on I, one I, either side of the line is quite a task in itself. Because yes, you don't definitely. know until the end, do you? Yeah. And you don't know until you've tried oh. all possible. Things. And even beyond the end, because often okay, you write your software and it's it runs on your laptop and gets you your result, and you write your paper or your PhD thesis. But then maybe you want to do some more work with it later on or someone else from your group goes, oh yeah, can I use that software? But I actually want to run it on a data set that's 10 times larger. And suddenly at that point, the, the way that software needs to be written starts to shift a bit. And I, I don't have an easy answer for that one, unfortunately. Um, there's this whole sort of long tail of you know, research things that are um, you know, small tasks that often tend to grow a bit when they get adopted by somebody else. And whether those need, you know, RSE time or whether they need to run HPC, it's always a bit unclear. Okay. And a lot of things transfer from starting to be single researcher projects that run on their laptop to things that run much bigger on HPC systems. Uh, could I ask that? You, you talked uh, about humanities becoming uh, more involved in the need for things like HPC, but of course their uh, training requirements must be very different from uh, people in the physical sciences. Yes. Um, how are you adapting to, to that very different need? I'm not sure we've got the answer for that one yet. It's still too early to know. Um, I mean, one thing I do see is that they're sort of trying to find champions within those communities who can maybe speak both languages a bit. So you've got people with a humanities background and a bit of computation background and you know, finding people who can do software engineering and physical sciences research is hard enough. Finding someone who can do computation and humanities is a massively harder task. Yeah. Um, but where you can find those people, they, they can be a great bridge between the um, the two groups. Right, another question in the chat. You mentioned the university has just got some new A100s. What other hardware does the university have on the higher end? What kind of performance does it have? Um, within IBERS, there's a cluster that I ended up running, which has got about 500 processing cores um, and a lot of storage because a lot of the stuff IBERS is doing is very storage intensive. Um, so I think there's over a petabyte of storage on that. Um, in computer science, there's a, a small cluster with a couple of nodes, but quite a large amount of memory. I think there's 1.5 terabytes of RAM on one of them. Um, and there are some older GPUs as well. So we've got some other um, V100 GPUs that were the previous generation that aren't quite as fast, but still quite respectable and good enough for a lot of machine learning applications. They'll still transfer, a, uh, train up a reasonable neural network in a few hours time. Um, and then also we've got access to this whole set of supercomputing whales, which is actually run by Swansea University, but we have equal access to it um, and as Swansea University researchers do. I'm sure so this is all intended for research purposes. This is not for um, undergraduates to come and mess about with unless you're doing maybe a research related dissertation. Um, occasionally we do a bit of teaching with these things, but there's not much teaching done on this at the moment. 
And another question, how would industry provide the data for a researcher to use HPC? Well, I think that depends on the industry and the, the research area. I mean, do you mean actually how they'd physically transfer it or right. what sort of data they'd give? Or? Michael, do you, do you want to unmute and perhaps clarify that question? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I should give you a bit of background. I work for Welsh Water and I was involved in a piece of work recently where we were looking at um, <coughs> coastal modelling and we were looking at a piece of work where we were transferring the hydraulic modelling data that we currently have in one of our systems to allow uh, for research. And we had a lot of questions about how we were going to transfer that modelling data, what format it was going to be in, what structure and I'm just thinking whether there's a standard that we should just apply and we could just say if we can provide all the following information from hydraulic modeling or or any of our, uh, any of our other large data sets to make it easier for researchers to access so I just noticed that one of the slides one of the slides mentioned about improving the data are you concerned about how big the data is or the, just the format no, of it? The size. It's just, you know, what data do you need? What format do you need it in? I, I think that would depend totally on the researcher in that area and what their, their needs are and what the software they've got is. So ideally the researchers should specify that when they make yes. a request. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. I, mean, I guess also what's nice is open data formats that, you know, open source software can deal with and that could be perhaps shared later on if that data is shareable that it can be published in a data repository alongside any publication and someone else could then reproduce the result could we make that um, a requirement of the research that the data is available for other people i'm thinking just to make uh, it easier for other people to do research you might get somebody who yeah normally I the opposite from industry problem. industry is um possessive of data and doesn't want to let anyone but the researcher they're sharing it with have it but if you want to make it public that's brilliant I, I think if anybody wanted to do anything to do with hydrology, so ri river basins, flooding, flooding data, you mentioned flooding earlier on. We have tons of that data lying around. We have a whole team that look after it. I don't think it'd be a massive issue for anybody in Welsh Water to provide it. There'd be some hoops that you'd have to jump through, but that's just the normal stuff you'd have to go through. And what I'd recommend if it's not, if it's a sort of a gigabytes order of size, is there is a data repository called Zenodo and you can publish data sets with them and you actually get a, a DOI, a digital object identifier reference that's quite good for them people to be able to cite the data set afterwards. Oh, cool. Um, Could you type, that, type the um, yeah. that organisation is and I'll have, I'll have a chat with the, hydro, the manager of managers hydrology because I know he's always getting lots of requests. Thank you. But basically, you know, they'll handle all the hosting of it. Um, they're run by CERN, so their long term funding is pretty secure. And I think they'll take data sets up to 50 gigabytes each, but you can publish multiple data sets. Oh, course, because if it's, if it's a large, really large data set, then we could do, we could just separate it by like region or something. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Yeah, so instead of publishing, secure. say, the whole of Wales, you could publish each county separately. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thanks very much. Once again, Colin, thank you very much. A uh, very interesting talk. And... Uh, uh, a lively discussion at the end and um, everybody thank you for your attendance look forward to seeing you at uh, future midwars webinars